will continue our conference day with session number two, and uh, we have also one and a half hour uh, for it. In this session, we will discuss some of the stability and growth measures, uh, like national reforms, financial assistance, uh, and investment programs. And I realize that it's a really broad topic, uh, so hopefully we can cover uh, at least a part of it. The EU has implemented measures to boost growth by encouraging investments, um, restoring trust in the financial system and dealing with structural issues. This was done through a better coordination. Financial assistance, capital requirements and better supervision uh, are working, um, and the final goal of a banking union is set. Financial support to the member states has been conditional. Comprehensive fiscal, structural and supervisory reforms have been implemented in the recipient countries. However, it would be possible to achieve a better result by improving the coherence between uh, programs and instruments and by simplifying their functioning. So we will discuss over these ideas. For example, what can be done to achieve convergence and coherence of EU financial assistance measures? What incentives could be assured the implementation of structural reforms in member states? And should the link between European semester and EU financing be strengthened? Should national reforms uh, uh, be rewarded? Let me introduce our distinguished speakers for this session. First keynote speaker is Mr. Ardo Hansson from the Estonian Central Bank. Second keynote speaker is Ms. Mari Givinemi from OECD. After the keynote speeches, I will give the floor to the session's co-chair, Mr. Roberto Gualtieri from European Parliament, but you already know him. Both keynote speakers will have uh, around 15 minutes um, to make their speeches, and then we have uh, 45, 50 minutes for the debate. And um, just to remind you that you can already sign up for the interventions and remarks and questions. Uh, just pushing the button. So, I would like to warmly welcome our first speaker in this session, Mr. Ardo Hansson, the governor of the Estonian Central Bank, um, which is a member of the European system of central banks. Mr. Hansson has also worked in the World Bank uh, and is a highly regarded Estonian economist. Mr. Hansson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Holzer, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and uh, and gentlemen, I'd like to first of all thank the organizers for a very diverse program focused on very topical issues and thank those of you who traveled far and wide to attend this, uh, this meeting. Maybe it's been discussed already, I'm sorry we couldn't organize better weather for you, but it's not like this all the time. This is the worst I've seen in a long uh, time, which makes it maybe more productive to stay inside. It uh, goes without saying that you as parliamentarians uh, have or will have and should have the final say on many of the issues that we, uh, we discuss. Uh, we in Estonia, I think, want to be part of these debates even beyond our presidency-related uh, role, uh, current role. And uh, I think we've always tried to be an active, constructive, uh, pro-European uh, uh, voice. And uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, the Euro area, and there's this Eurobarometer survey that says which is the, where is the Euro most popular? I think it's always either Estonia, Luxembourg, Ireland, or Slovenia, which are competing for, for top spots. So this is one of the most pro-Euro places in, on the continent, and uh, we have a particular interest in making sure that that works, uh, works well. Uh, I think also that we, I think broader, not only Estonia, but in the Baltics have a fair bit to, uh, to offer. I think every country's track record is far from perfect, and we have had our major issues, boom-bust cycles and so on, which we haven't always controlled, but I think our overall track record has been very strong, both as concerns economic growth. There was a recent uh, ECB bulletin which looked at the Baltic states as a kind of, in a kind of annex, and if you look at some of those growth performances of average growth being 4 or 5 percent for 15 or 20 years, I think that is something that uh, is consistent with, uh, with what we're trying to achieve. And the second issue is then resilience in terms of uh, responding to and, uh, and resisting shocks in ways that, that the economy continues to function, macroeconomic policy is sustainable, uh, fiscal space is maintained, and we can maintain, uh, solve our problems uh, while not burdening, uh, or burdening others as little as, as possible. And I think if you look far and wide in Europe, this is the same picture that emerges. You take any issue 
and you look at World Bank indicators, uh, OECD ratings, you look at, uh, at World Economic Forum or uh, those types of bodies, you'll always find European countries at the top of any one, almost any one of those charts, which I think means that the, the fact that we're part of a common union is, no, is in no way a hindrance to, uh, to uh, or it doesn't make it impossible to do a lot of things. It's actually, maybe it discourages at times, but it's certainly, uh, uh, many countries have reached the top of any kind of chart uh, working in this environment. So I think that has to be borne in mind. To me, the topics of discussion for the second session really boil down to one question, how to help governments do what they have to do to make the economy work better. Now, definition of structural reforms, I guess this is a broad term. We think of steps, various policy changes, institutional strengthening towards two, two goals. One is raising the growth potential of the economy and second to improve the resilience of the economy. And I think we used to call this just improving economic fundamentals. Uh, I think at the outset of the EMU, it was expected that giving up the option to change exchange rates and interest rates on a national level would increase the incentives for reform that improve productivity and resilience. By removing the exchange rate instrument, then we had no other choice but to make our product and labor markets very uh, flexible and, or more flexible and, uh, and resilient. Now, 20 years later, I think we have a very credible monetary policy framework and we're seeing uh, deep in financial integration. But I think in two areas we have, have, have experienced problems. One is uh, slackening of productivity growth, uh, as many national governments uh, haven't really uh, pushed through many of the reforms that could, could be pushed through. And if we look now at the current developments in the Euro area, we see growth of about 2.2% a year, but the problem is really not so much in, in, a, in a low level of demand, but we see a structural, if you look at uh, measures of potential GDP growth, some of them say 1.2% a year. That's pretty poor performance that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't accept. So we could, be, have a, we could have a stronger baseline. And the other issue is then, uh, is then insufficient resilience related to lack of fiscal uh, space, uh, the distribution of that fiscal space over, over countries. I think we've had an issue before with bank capital, which now is much... Uh, is much better. Generally, having more equity and less debt in the system is going to increase the resilience of our, uh, our economies and in increase the shock absorbing capacity. Uh, the cyclical recovery and supportive financial uh, conditions present now are a kind of window of opportunity. At the last IMF meetings, this was the central theme to talk about this window of opportunity. I don't think it's something that opened up a few months ago. It's actually been there for a few years with all of the p policies that made, let's say, interest rates as low as they, as they were. And, uh, but it's a window to push through reforms both at the EU and, and Euro area levels. Uh, but why is it that several reports, let's say, by the OECD and ECB and so on, conclude that the reform drive has been declining in the, last, in the past couple of years? One is it, issue is it is it an issue of lack of ideas, and I think the answer to that is, uh, is no. We need ideas, we need po uh, political will, but, uh, and ideas come from knowledge of best practices in economic policy, either from the Commission, from OECD and other international bodies. And second, we need political will to follow through with reforms that may be costly economically, financially, and politically. And I think there's no lack of information both country experiences and academic research of what works and what doesn't work. There's a lot out there, and I think national authorities and institutions are often best placed to work out and use the, to collect those ideas and try to make them work in their national settings. And then the international institutions can provide good recommendations. However, the country-specific recommendations have not always been taken on board. And I remember pie charts from one or two years ago when we looked at all of the EU reform uh, recommendations and how many had been uh, implemented. And I think there was a 4% sliver that said these are reforms that have actually been implemented and the rest, the other 96% were either not implemented or, or partially implemented. So uh, the track record is, uh, is, uh, is slow. Uh, some, uh, there may be some of the countries that, may, that made progress when they were under formal programs, then it may be easier to push through some of the, uh, the, some of the reforms. And I think this, our country is no exception. When times are bad, we sometimes did more than when times are, uh, times are, uh, are good. So this window can open, but it's sometimes tricky to, uh, 
to make use of it when the pressure is suddenly, uh, suddenly gone. And I think so we shouldn't raise expectations too high with this window of opportunity narrative. Uh, whereas the divergence in policies to meet the accepted targets may be perfectly understandable, I think the advisory capacity of these institutions is not always put to best use. Next question then, is it a, because of a lack of money? Uh, I've often heard it said that EU are national fiscal rules and the burden of recurrent public expenditures don't leave enough room, maneuvering room to finance structural reforms. Uh, it depends. I think there are some reforms that you need to do because, precisely because you're spending too much money on, on certain areas. And, uh, and uh, maybe having this kind of uh, pressure actually build is the moment when you can, uh, you can deal with large inefficiencies in public spending, for instance. Uh, and uh, however, there are other reforms that have no cost to the government budget, so there can be no link between, between having money or no money and reform performance. And I think also the flexibility in implementing the Stability and Growth Pact delivers at least some relief in the case of structural, uh, structural reforms. And of course, there may be some reforms that where you do need upfront cash, and it actually is a problem that you don't have, uh, that you have limited fiscal resources. So I think it's hard to generalize. Political cost may be significant. The gains and losses from reforms are often unevenly distributed across the economy and over time, and people can be influenced by small but political, uh, politically powerful agents who fight to preserve their privileges and so on. Um, so the existing resources, I think, could be used better. And I argued before that the advent of the euro did not turn out to be the kind of reform stimulus that it was expected to be. In fact, it has been, in many cases, it has been quite the opposite. And I think the euro has supported capital inflows and borrowing that has made, made borrowing cheaper for governments. And there may have been a time in the past when, when you made mistakes, you paid yourself for them. And uh, now when there's a, big, a bigger kind of a, there's a safety net which, uh, which uh, damps the signal between maybe not so good policies and, and the price you have to, uh, you have to pay. There, so there may be reduced incentives to reform in some cases because of this structure that otherwise has many positive features. I think one example of how softer budget constraints re can reduce incentives for reform is the existence of persistent and large productivity differences even within many of our countries. And I think regional uh, differences have persisted for decades, even though we have, uh, many of the countries have made large transfers of the, uh, to these regions for a considerable period of time. And there may be very other reasons uh, why, why GDP per capita, let's say, differs within countries. But it may be that in certain cases, having large transfers may have had a negative impact on, uh, on regional long-run productivity growth by reducing the incentives for change. Oh, it's all to say that I think it's tricky to construct these formulations that will ultimately unlock, uh, unlock reforms and that weakly designed financial assistance between member states might be counterproductive. So improvement possible but not forgiven. And I think the background paper for today's event addresses another important issue. It, it appears that there are too many rules and regulations that apply to the current financial instruments of the of the EU, and I think their complexity may have become an obstacle to their efficient use. Uh, and according to the experience of some of the new member states, uh, EU transfers tend to peak two or three years after the start of the multi-annual framework. And this uh, can mean that there are rigidities in the system and can make it somewhat pro-cyclical. And we face that now in our own country, that we had the last three years actually where the use of some of these EU funds was actually quite slow because new projects were being prepared, we were taking our time, and now suddenly these projects are all prepared, they're ready to take off exactly at a time when our economy is taking off by itself. And rather than helping us to smooth, this, uh, to combat volatility, it's actually exacerbating the volatility because the, these pro the monies are on their own cycle. In September, the informal economic ECOFIN gathered in the same building, in the same room, to discuss the way forward to a more integrated EMU. And I think there was a broad consensus that the new framework should be more supportive of reforms. Uh, and I think views on the details of the solutions varied. But to me, the key arguments were over the role of the European institutions in promoting reforms and over the list of responsibilities that should remain at the national level. Uh, the current role of the central institutions regarding structural reforms is twofold. Uh, 
applying the Stability and Growth Pact and Macroeconomic Imbalances Procedure and then proposing country-specific recommendations. And I think this kind of framework is a good starting uh, point uh, for the coordination of structural reforms. A couple of years ago, a new instrument, the Structural Reform Support Program, was initiated. Uh, this program coordinates and provides country-specific technical support to all EU countries. And I think such support reinforces the reform capacity of EU countries by combining national ownership with expertise of the European Commission, a very nice, nicely balanced fit. The Commission's recent reflection papers introduced the idea of reinforcing, reinforcing the link between national reforms and EU funding, or suggesting that there could be financial rewards for structural reforms. Uh, although I know that currently there's a, role, a rule that, kind of, that countries that violate the Stability and Growth Pact may lose access to EU funding, but this has been very difficult to use in, uh, in practice. So the threat of sanctions doesn't always provide the right incentives. And I think if we would reverse this process and say countries that make progress get more money has its own set of challenges. Which structural reforms are we going to uh, reward and what is the price tag for each one of these structural reforms? Moreover, as this decision is not made at the national level, it it's likely to increase the democratic deficit in the European Union. So now we're waiting for new proposals by the Commission that are expected to include establishing a stabilization instrument, Euro Area Minister of Finance and Special Budget Line for the Euro Area. I think in the best case scenario, these innovations may support structural reforms by overcoming the political obstacles typical at the national level. However, we must be careful not to weaken national responsibility by delivering new powers uh, to the EU or the Euro area because there are some reforms for which the responsibility should l remain at the national level while others require coordination. I think and largely dependent on the existence or not of material cross-border externalities. I think it's natural that the responsibility for long-term economic and social outcomes lies mainly with the national authorities. E Euro area countries are different in many ways and I think they should have the right to tailor their policies to their own conditions and preferences. And the primary responsibility pro for providing this information on the trade-off could rest with the national authorities who are able to identify their country's needs and opportunities. And this information could then be presented to the public in the form of reform targets, timetables, and cost-benefit analyses. Uh, at the same time, the European level has the main responsibility for enhancing and completing banking union capital markets union, uh, single market for services, and so on. And uh, the smooth functioning and resilience of the euro area requires reforms that foster private sector cross-border risk sharing via financial integration. And I think it's important to increase the incentives for banks and private investors to hold a diversified portfolio of assets from several euro area member states. And cross-border risk sharing is particularly important for countries in a monetary union. And one option that has been suggested is, uh, is uh, creating a public stabilization instrument intended to smooth the cyclical developments on a national level. Uh, and we know that effective stabilization at a national level is much easier if public debt is kept moderate and fiscal positions remain strong. Uh, it's the duty of national authorities to strengthen automatic stabilizers and, the uh, and they should also improve the ability of the private sector to manage shocks. Several research papers indicate that private cross-border risk-sharing channels are much weaker in the euro area than in, for instance, the United States. And private risk-sharing looks especially promising because of the sums involved can be quite large compared with the amounts the governments are ready to allocate at the EU level. So to conclude, we have to overcome the resistance to reforms. The appetite for reform could be supported by well-designed and time-consistent incentive mechanisms at the EU level. We need to improve the framework of governance, but it's important to keep the system of incentives in balance, rights bring responsibilities, and vice versa. The Commission proposal seems to be mainly on the side of positive, positive financial incentives, but I believe in parallel we have to work on strengthening market pressure in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Mari Givinemi, the Deputy General uh, of the OECD. In the OECD, um, among other topics, she is responsible for the 
strategic oversight of the OECD's work on efficient and effective governance. Ms. Kibinemi has been a member of the Finnish Parliament where she has chaired uh, several committees. Uh, she has also held several ministers' portfolios and has served as the Prime Minister of Finland. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hoxma, Mr. Kualtieri, uh, Governor Hansen, ladies and gentlemen, happy to be here uh, with uh, you uh, and share the OECD's view on structural reforms, so what should be done in your countries and also at the, uh, together at the European uh, level. And thank you very much uh, for the Finance Committee of Rikikoku and the Parliament of Estonia uh, for inviting uh, uh, me to this uh, session. And you as uh, members of Parliament and uh, members of the European Parliament really have a crucial role when it comes to designing, delivering and also implementing uh, policies in your countries. And it is not an easy task uh, uh, to find the best policies uh, and the best ways uh, to implement uh, the policies. But there the OECD uh, comes uh, to the picture. We offer policy analysis and advice, uh, benchmarking and sharing best uh, practices. And that is exactly what I'm going to do now. I will focus on the OECD's view, views on the reform priorities in Europe and highlighting uh, the particular importance of sustained momentum for investment and picking up the pace concerning structural reform uh, efforts. But let's uh, start with the good news. As you, hear, see, as you uh, see uh, here, we finally have good news uh, globally, as well as in European Union uh, countries. We have even some signs that our economies may finally be escaping the low growth trap. So the global economy is now growing at its fastest pace since 2010 facilitated by policy support, accompanied with solid employment gains, and a recovery in trade growth is following now slums in late 2015 and early 16. So as you see here, September OECD interim economic outlook shows that global GDP growth uh, will be about 3.5% this year and about 3.7% uh, next year. And in the Euro area, uh, growth is now more broad-based and it is like to, likely to average close to 2% per annum this and next year thanks to accommodative monetary policy, a mild fiscal easing, rising employment rates, reduced to certain extent at least uh, political uncertainty, but of course some challenges remain. Problems from weak credit growth and sizable non-performing loans have eased, but continue to be constraints in some countries. Here I come to the same message uh, with uh, Governor Hansen also had uh, uh, when it comes to investments. The improvement in growth really is uh, welcome, but policymakers must not be complacent. The effects of prolonged subpar growth after the financial crisis are still present in investment, as you can see here, and it's also present in trade and wage developments. So the investment recovery has been very weak compared to other uh, recoveries uh, uh, in earlier uh, years. And also when you have a look at the investment uh, shortfalls uh, falls uh, by countries, you see here in Italy, Germany, France, uh, uh, and also UK, uh, that more investment really are needed if you want to have a look at the long-term uh, uh, need. And the same challenges are accentuated when looking at investments at the regional level. Sub-national governments in EU countries in OECD account for 52.6% of total public investments. And across all EU countries, sub-national public investment has decreased by almost 18% uh, between 2009 and 2014. And th this uh, means about 5% per year in real terms. And while in 2014, uh, public investment at the central government level seemed to be slightly recovering in the EU uh, public investment at the sub-national level 
nevertheless declined. So this low investment rate is not the only bad news. In addition to that, productivity growth has been weak during the crisis, and this has come on top of a rapidly aging population. So combined, this would reduce the long-term uh, growth potential of European economies. And when we dig a little bit further or, or deeper uh, to uh, the uh, productivity uh, development, we can see here that productivity gaps have widened and that has, of course, then led uh, to wage inequality uh, or increasing wage inequality in OECD uh, countries. So we have uh, in um, all the EU countries and actually at the OECD countries, uh, firms which are performing well, the productivity development in those uh, is very good, even excellent, but then we have the non-frontier firms uh, where the development is uh, much uh, worse, as you can see uh, here. And also when we go to the regional level, here kind of the same phenomena as uh, when it comes to uh, investments, the same challenges are accentuated when looking at the regional level. So the productivity divide we see across firms, we also see here uh, across regions uh, in the same uh, country. And the last OECD regional outlook highlighted that this divide between frontier regions of a country and the rest grew by 60% over the last couple of decades. And while convergence across countries has been taking place, we also see in many cases divergence within countries, albeit this divergence has stabilized somewhat uh, since the crisis. So we don't have the figures of the uh, past uh, uh, two, three years, but uh, uh, you can see so far uh, the development. So some progress may be made uh, in the last uh, uh, two, three years. So the pace of reforms has slowed, uh, especially uh, in the countries hit by crisis, as you can see here, and more reforms really are uh, needed. Uh, as you saw, the development which we have seen in productivity uh, and investment uh, and uh, uh, growth, uh, more structural reforms are needed, but the slowdown in the uh, pace of structural reform documented through our going for growth exercise is deeply uh, concerning. This going for growth uh, publication is OECD's uh, flagship uh, annual report on structural policies. And here uh, we have had a look uh, uh, to what extent uh, countries have implemented uh, the reforms we have suggested uh, them and recommended uh, them. And, and really, as you see here, concerning these countries which are covered uh, on this slide, uh, the pace of reforms has steadily declined uh, in Europe uh, since 2011, 2012, but uh, the pace has also been a bit uh, uneven, so some progress made in, in certain uh, countries. And that being said, countries where we found that the pace of reforms to have increased in 2015-16 as compared to 2013-14 to 14, include Germany, Denmark, France, Italy, and uh, Sweden. And here you see uh, the same um, uh, development um, uh, in Central uh, Europe, uh, so same kind of uh, phenomena, uh, uh, the growth, uh, uh, or the performance uh, uh, has uh, uh, worsened. But really, as, as has been said uh, in, uh, in many uh, of you actually already in the discussion, and also by the uh, keynote speakers uh, today, uh, reforms are, are needed. But what we recommend the countries to do is to package the reform. So in many countries, uh, the reforms which have been undertaken, they have been undertaken in either labor or product markets, but not so often in both areas. And really, in order to uh, achieve uh, uh, results, uh, 
this uh, packaging is what we highly recommend. And here you can see that when it comes to our recommendations, uh, for every country, we make recommendations for at least in two areas, in jobs, uh, in skills, uh, or uh, in, in firms. Uh, and when it comes to jobs, labor market reforms, more flexibility in the labor market, in skills, uh, better life uh, uh, long learning opportunities, uh, uh, improving the education system, and also uh, uh, giving to those people who uh, lose their jobs uh, uh, possibilities to uh, retrain and educate uh, themselves uh, more. And then when it comes to firms, more innovation, more competition, less regulation. And then, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to these uh, recommendations to the European uh, Union here in a uh, nutshell, so we really uh, much uh, see uh, uh, the future of the European Union the same way as the, the Commission when it comes to the uh, recommendations. Uh, first, what is needed is uh, to increase the public investment in, especially uh, in those countries where there is uh, uh, room uh, for manoeuvre uh, and also uh, what is needed uh, is the leveraging of uh, private uh, investment. And of course, this is what the Juncker plan also is aiming to achieve and it uh, should be uh, pursued. Also, a faster implementation of Europe's energy, telecom and digital single markets is uh, vital to force the investment, uh, productivity, growth and trade. And I would add here also uh, the services uh, market um, and, the, and the single market in uh, services. Uh, more uh, work is uh, needed also in that uh, area. Further, addressing remaining problems in the uh, financial sector, bolder action to resolve non-performing non loans completing the banking union, ensuring that financial resources are channeled to productive ends with special focus on SMEs. And also the EU needs to better support its uh, citizens in the face of globalization. And this is of course in the, uh, mostly in the hands of uh, uh, the member states. So more effective upskilling, retrading, guidance and job search support for youth and the long-term unemployed, also increase uh, the focus of education policies and lifelong learning would facilitate a swifter transition of workers between jobs and the adoption of uh, new technologies. Uh, we have uh, helped many European countries uh, in designing and implementing reforms uh, and policies in, in these and other key areas. We have worked a lot with Italy and Spain, also with uh, France when it comes to labor market uh, reforms, um, uh, and also together with the uh, Commission uh, in the uh, Sigma uh, program, uh, we uh, improve uh, uh, the public governance uh, and management uh, of, uh, of the uh, neighborhood uh, countries and the countries which would like to join the European uh, Union. Uh, and also uh, with Greece, we have had a quite a, a deep uh, cooperation uh, when it comes to uh, designing and also implementing uh, the structural reforms. So happy to continue that work uh, with uh, your uh, governments. But to conclude my uh, presentation, a few words on uh, EU's uh, cohesion policy, which I know that is uh, currently discussed not only at the European Parliament, but also in, in national uh, parliaments uh, when heading towards uh, uh, the next uh, uh, phase. And here, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the OECD's uh, vision um, how uh, cohesion policy uh, should be uh, developed. So this place uh, based uh, policies really uh, has a role and it is uh, a complementary uh, to structural reforms and really critical uh, for inclusive uh, growth. So the European structural and, and investment funds are the main place-based uh, tools in the European toolbox and are important for new member states, but also Eurozone uh, 
uh, countries for which there are no intergovernmental budget uh, transfers. So they are increasingly focused on helping regions anticipate change, not merely respond uh, to it. And at a time when subnational public investment has been hit hard, as you saw, these uh, funds have been one of the few stable sources supporting investment during this post-crisis period, particularly for subnational governments. But really the question is how to make most of these funds. Of course, these funds have increasingly focused on the key enablers for economic growth, including infrastructure, innovation, and skills, and they should continue, of course, on this uh, track. And several factors can help, can help make the most of uh, these fund, funds. Uh, what is needed are complementary structural reforms, such as those just uh, mentioned. They are one step and reason for having uh, also the ex-ante conditionalities associated with their use. And a need for the different regions to identify their most important bottlenecks to growth and pressing social challenges to tackle those head on. And also EU regional policy should add to rather than substitute uh, for national uh, public uh, spending. So we have also been uh, looking at the uh, EU uh, budget focused on results. So this, this will be uh, uh, launched uh, after some uh, months. Uh, uh, we have uh, contributed to the Commission's uh, uh, efforts um, in order to uh, reform uh, the budget uh, system. Uh, but so far, as you can see uh, here, the uh, EU is performing uh, quite well. There are strengths in the EU model of budgeting for performance, which is very well specified by uh, global uh, standards. But Actually, uh, Mr. Chair, I think I have used all my time uh, already, but what I want to, ladies and gentlemen, say at the end really is that uh, cooperative solutions have enabled Europe to cement growth and make it more inclusive. And this continued cooperation is needed to implement effective solutions to common uh, problem. And the alternative to collective action is not status quo, but something worse, and the risk that Europe will move uh, backwards. And the OECD stands ready to work together with you to address these fundamental challenges through contributing our experience and sharing best practices through our cross-cutting forums. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Kivinemi, for this interesting uh, presentation. And uh, before moving on with the debate, I uh, will give a word to Mr. Gualtieri. And then, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I think we had two excellent presentations, and so I look forward to listen to the comments of colleagues. I think that, uh, indeed, they show very clearly that uh, we have not just cyclical, but structural problem and we need both structural reform and investments. I would not see the two things in contradiction and I have some doubts on the concept of negative uh, effect on incentive uh, by transfer. Is there a good transfer, of course, and we see that uh, structural fund provided, youth structural fund provide a good quality of, of, of transfer. Uh, indeed, we need to improve our capacity to implement structural reform, I think also we need to improve our, the quality of our concept of structural reform to make it a bit broader because, uh, uh, I make an, an, an example, we are saying now two things that we need to reconcile more. We are saying, yes, we need for flexibility in the labor market, and we are saying we have enough rise of wages and we have a problem with inflation, and even we see the ECB saying, oh, we need a bit more trade unions, be a bit more stronger with, with wages. So, uh, so what does it mean? It means, of course, flexibility is good, 
but uh, just thinking that we uh, regain productivity compensating the lack of uh, uh, the, the fixed exchange rate with just labor devaluation maybe is not what exactly we need. So then we need flexibility, but also uh, wide social protection networks and not just to, so this is, this is a sample, an example how our concept maybe a structure for needs to become a bit more granular more uh, also up to the, to the challenge of, 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 of a big challenge of, 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 of a need to increase our output gap, output gap to, 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 need more, to have more innovation, more research, more, more, more school, more children learning, more, more, more students going uh, also not to do just applica, uh, just also doing, let's say, pure sciences. So it's, it's, I think we, we need also a reassessment of our, to make it broader of our, concept of, 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 of structural reform, where I totally agree maybe incentive do work better than fines. We saw altogether how the, in concrete, the fair example of application of macroeconomic conditionality didn't work very well, actually, and everybody was looking just for a solution, not to have to do this. So I, I, I'm afraid that we need to find something better. But I also agree, I'd say, with the Governor Hanson that we need uh, the no, also the incentives, uh, financial incentive alone doesn't work. We need really the, the ownership. And uh, that's why we as a parliament propose this concept of a, a convergence code to try, trying to combine common targets and national means in a, mer in a, in a, in a better way, more, more in line with, a, with the concept of multi-level, multi multi-level governance. Final remark, and I will be, be careful, Let's, we, we all should be careful about unintended consequences. I was saying something before. Yes, market discipline is important, where market discipline provides more disruption that, that could result, then it might be counterproductive. Yes, bold action of MPS are needed, but you just produce a, a guy, a, an addendum which, which forced to sell altogether the MPLs and you have the decline in the price, you might make happy some hedge fund, but not uh, providing a, a problem to, to, to really uh, improving situation of SME and bank balance sheet. So uh, that requires a high quality of uh, our policy actions, and uh, that's the challenge, and that's also where I hope our debate will give us more inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colteri. Uh, now we'll move on with the debate, and uh, I'll remind you that to keep your personal interventions uh, in two minutes. And the first one uh, will be Ms. Maria Plas uh, from Sweden, so please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a personal reflection on the European Fund of Strategic uh, Investment, uh, EFSI. I, of course, understand the need of investments in Europe and uh, that the EU have to encourage growth and well-prepared projects. But I have some questions about FC. In the light of Brexit and the eventual decreasing EU budget, how do you look on the future of FC after 2020? Uh, the evaluation of FC is to be done as late as uh, 2018 after the increasing of the FC budget. Uh, could you please give me some reflection on that? And at last, uh, do FC fully compensate for the other missing structural reforms? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, next intervention, intervention from uh, Mr. Janis Vukans from Latvia. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. I would like to, sh uh, to share some thoughts on the topic what incentives could assure more efficient implementation of structural reforms in member states based on our Latvian experience. We in the Parliament of Latvia fully share the view that there should be efficient incentives to implement structural reforms. We see that both reward instruments and sanction instruments should be in place. It's clear that real structural reforms bring long-term fruits but often require fiscal and political short-term costs, and therefore, politically, it's very difficult to implement them. On the reward side, uh, we in EU already have the SPG flexibility instruments allowing member states to deviate from deficit targets in case of implementation of structural reforms with positive long-term effect on public finances. 
We think that these mechanisms need to be improved to ensure that flexibility clause is granted only in, only in the case if there are, is a verifiable positive fiscal effect. If member state fails to implement reform, deviation should be annulled and full compensation of deviation should be required. We have also arguments to support uh, stronger linkage between the EU funds programming and envisage structural reforms. What concerns the sanction side, we are skeptical of ideas to suspend EU structural funds in case uh, countries fail to implement reforms. Why? Uh, because uh, if structural reform is not implemented, it's natural that these funds either are not used are, uh, or are uh, redirected to other projects. But suspension of EU funds as sanction mechanism in our view is not fair. Both net recipients and net contributors need to implement structural reforms. Taking into account spillover effect from successful reform implementation, both net recipients and net contributors gain from reform implementation. Therefore, the sanction mechanisms should be developed in a way to ensure equal treatment among net recipients and net contributors. We see two main ways to explore the introduction of fines and market discipline, like automatic sovereign debt restructuring if country fails in structural reforms apply for the European Stability Mechanism Program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker is Lord Desai from UK again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the decline in productivity growth is not just an EU problem, but it is basically a global problem as Robert Gordon's book on the USA shows. Productivity is declining everywhere. And some of the fundamental questions we need to ask is are really about are we measuring the correct thing? And is it possible that productivity can go on growing if the economy is shifting from goods to services? because productivity is more difficult to measure in services than in goods. Uh, notice that four of the biggest corporations today uh, are all in service sector and, you know, uh, and they're not in manufacturing. You have Facebook and Google and Amazon, uh, uh, people like that who, who just basically make lots of money and how do you measure productivity of Facebook? So I think we have to be careful about what we are measuring and are we measuring the correct thing. Uh, so secondly, I would like to say is that we need to take the view that perhaps we are at the end of a long cycle and we are waiting for the upsurge of the next set of innovations. And we don't know where they're gonna come from, but they're not gonna come from government policy. They're gonna come from private initiatives. And the question is, how do we make it possible for private initiative to have growth? I think the only condition would be to have a accommodative monetary policy, which will give low interest rates for, for, for inventors, uh, which therefore they can take risks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kai Turunen from Finland. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Let me say a few words on national reforms and uh, measures taken in Finland to boost growth and investment. I'm happy to say that we have been able to bring Finnish economy back in the path of growth. We have taken and are still taking reforms and uh, investments. I would highlight areas like uh, bioeconomy, clean technologies and uh, digitalization. I would also pay attention uh, to investments like a bioproduct meal uh, with value of uh, 1.2 billion euros on this year. To boost investment, uh, we also need a good regulatory uh, framework. We need to make sure that EU regulations do not create obstacles for investments in Finland. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dimitrios Mardas from Greece, please. Mr. Chairman, in this session we have some key words, let's say. One is recovery, the second is how to boost growth, 
and uh, out of financial tools, we believe that we can boost, uh, boost growth through structural reforms, uh, through pressure for more labor market regulations and all that. And why all this? Because we want to increase productivity and hence competitiveness. And all this because we operate in an open international market where we face international competition. Mari has uh, pointed out uh, two interesting things. The first is that um, we saw through the tables that there is a decline in productivity and investment uh, in the frame of the industrial countries. And the second, that uh, there is a persistence in a huge growth of India and China. And uh, one question that we have to face in the context of commission first and then uh, in the frame of the other institutions of the EU is the following. If we face some threats which are associated to this international environment, we have to give the appropriate replies. What is a main threat? A main threat is dumping on behalf of the third world, of developing countries, and it is very interesting to see the social dumping which is applied. And everybody operates in the context of the open economy. In this case, if we consider that there is such kind of threats, we have to uh, insert appropriate measures. I have heard that the Commission uh, decided to insert as uh, selection criteria the absence of uh, selection criteria uh, in the context of public procurement, the absence of uh, underage workers of countries which are suppliers of the EU market. This is correct. And I think that we have to extend such kind of regulations in other areas. Second point uh, regarding investment product, uh, investment prog programs, I think that uh, we have to uh, increase uh, cross-border cooperation under any kind of scenarios, for example, to reinforce more subcontracting between uh, industries. And uh, finally, uh, we have to point, uh, we have to uh, push funding in the area of uh, education and health, and uh, all these efforts uh, uh, has to reinforce the social economy uh, in the frame of the European Union. Thank you. Mr. Peter Beringer from Germany. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a comment, and I have a um, concrete question directed at Governor Hanson. First, I would like to remind you that the European Union as is um, an alliance of sovereign nations and doesn't have the quality of um, an independent state itself. And I'd like to remind you um, of the principle of subsidiarity. Things should be regulated wherever they can be regulated at the lowest um, level. So it should be the usual case that investment programs, the rescue programs, economic programs, are um, established at national parliament level and not at the level of the European Union and um, also not by the ECB, which is the um, current um, normalcy. And today and tomorrow, this is what we should not forget, just as a side remark. And deriving from that, a question directed at Governor Hansen, um, now that you're here. The um, biggest ECB program at the moment is the asset purchase um, program, PSPP, um, CSPP. And of up to 60 to 70 billion euros per month. So the ECB is more or less a monopolist here, and um, it has, um, it, it's the only um, buyer of these bonds, and directly or at least indirectly. So these um, bond purchases that make up a um, large share of the rescue um, packages at the moment, do you personally believe that that is monetary policy or is it fiscal policy? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carla Parush from Portugal. Uh, 
Mes salutations, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, je prends la parole pour partager. Thank you very much. And I would like to um, take the floor in order to express my opinion on what can be done. Uh, in order to uh, find a better approach and coherence when it comes to financial measures in the EU. To the um, uh, greatest extent, I have to say that we have to really continue with the resources we have available to us. Uh, if you look at the uh, principle of subsidiarity, the employment, the social inclusion, all the competencies, the research and innovation, all these aspects are still uh, very important. Now, the economic and social uh, differences uh, can cause uh, conflicts uh, in the field of uh, social politics, and therefore we are obliged to find answers on the EU level. So in uh, now to conclude my brief uh, statement, I have to say that we need to continue and to correct these scenarios in order to solve these problems together. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Christian Petri from Germany. Thank you very much. I believe it is very good that we have a strong European component in fiscal policies. We know there are areas of um, policy areas that cannot be dealt with at national level, um, whether it's climate policy, peace policies, or also the question of global digitalization. In this context, I'd like to point out that subsidiarity is important, but fiscal policy and European programs have to be assessed in a positive way, also from a German point of view. My question um, refers to the assessment of the reforms carried out by the European Union. You mentioned the European semester and the active um, monetary policy of the ECB, which led to um, price stability. There are individual measures required at national level when it comes to implementing reforms. That is um, self-evident, um, something that works in Germany doesn't have to work elsewhere and vice versa. So I'm happy that the investment programs of the European Union take this into account. But the question is, if I use Germany as an example, when you implement structural reforms and when you're successful with this, there is the risk, as we have seen in Germany, that you see an increase of people in precarious employment and these people need to be the focus of attention after the structural reform. So my question for the panelists is, are social aspects included in the um, OECD measures or in the um, European semester? Because I think for the further development of social policies in Europe, it's extremely important to do this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Christos Taikouras uh, from Greece, please. Thank you, Chairman. What are the main lessons that can be drawn from the implementation of financial assistance programs in several EU countries? To overcome the crisis, it is essential fiscal discipline to be combined with delivering growth-enhancing structural reforms. Accurate fiscal multipliers and the appropriate composition of consolidation are crucial for sustainable public finances. Fiscal rules with embedded expenditure ceilings tend to generate durable results. A financial envelope that ensures the stability of the banking system is necessary. Programs should guarantee social cohesion and cater for the most vulnerable. Sustained ownership of the reform agenda is crucial for program success. Greece, over the last seven years, with substantial cost for the society, implements a bold economic adjustment program through the painful process of internal devaluation, which has led to the elimination of the twin deficit problems. However, many more should be done by the government and the institutions to capture the widening growth gap. We must set priorities. Acceleration of structural reforms like those included in the OECD toolkit 
and intensive implementation of the privatization program. Provision of liquidity to the real economy through absorption of EU funds, enhancement of public investment, repayment of arrears, and bolder actions to resolve non-performing loans. Change of fiscal policy mix, moving towards a gradual reduction of taxation, abolishment of capital controls and participation in the QE program, and finally, adoption of a national strategic plan for the productive reconstruction of the economy, investing in endogenous growth sources like education and innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paolo Corrieri Paleotti from Italy, please. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the excellent presentation. I'd like to add one uh, further dimension about structural reform. And it's a kind of dimension that economic analysis and IMF have been suggesting several times and even more recently. And it is the one that should distinguish between the structural reform that boosts aggregate demand more reliably and generate growth with respect to those reforms that destroy it. In this perspective, what should encourage during stagnation phases or weak recovery, those structural reforms that support short-term growth while postponing or discouraging those reforms that weaken demand and could penalize economic growth. In other words, structural reform are not all the same, and one should distinguish between them. As IMF shows, product market liberalization, for example, which increases both people purchasing power and companies' productivity, can be expected to boost growth to whatever the economic environment. But if we take labor market reform, for example, the things are different, and one should be very you know, uh, uh, cautious in how to distinguish among them. For example, they don't work well at times of fiscal tightening. Those kind of labor market reform that reduce demand could be even harmful in a recession. From, from this point of view, you know, I think that it's very important to highlight that in today's circumstances, the most promising labor market reform are those that stimulate demand, such lower taxes on labor and a bigger budget for labor market policy to get more people to work. So I'd like to ask both panelists what they think about this dimension and this distinction that is quite you know, promising in terms of uh, impact upon economic policy. Thanks very much. Thank you. And now Mr. Jens Brandenburg from Germany. Thank you very much. Um, we have talked a lot today about how the European family can be um, supportive and provide solidarity if um, some countries are in trouble. And the question is, how can we get these countries out of um, trouble and how can we um, prevent this problem from developing um, in the first place? As a representative of the young generation, I'd like to express my disappointment that the reform efforts, i.e. the efforts to improve things at a structural level in, a long, in the long run have um, dwindled out in the past years. Um, we know it's very hard that um, reforms aim at long-term um, effects and have a very high short-term cost. And as a policymaker, you only want to win the next um, election. But we have to clearly understand that this is not, that reform measures are not only um, happening on the backs of the policymakers, but that um, the young people in one's own country might have to suffer from these consequences in 10 to 15 years in um, difficult economic situations, bad um, job um, prospects, bad um, public investments, and inefficient um, state structures. Those are the young people who will have to suffer in the long run. If, for example, financial incentives by com linking the um, European semester with um, European subsidies can help to revigorize um, these reform efforts, then this can be positive as long as it is not used as an excuse to increase the overall budget. But I think the most important thing in Nash or for everybody represented in national parliaments is that it is our own responsibility in our own countries to carry out the reform efforts um, despite all of the um, political incentives. Thank you. 
Ms. Margarida Marquez uh, from Portugal, please. Thank you, President. Uh, I'd like to raise two different points, more on uh, institutional areas. Uh, the first one on better supervision. It means, I have the experience, we have the experience, different countries. Here we are speaking, the document speaks about eight countries that uh, had the support of the European Union. Uh, I, can, I know better the, the position of Portugal, and uh, I'd like to, to raise this point, better supervision, because I think that we need to find a more democratic supervision model. And we need to reinforce the role of the European Parliament and national parliaments. And when we speak about uh, politi um, policy advice, we need to respect more the democratic models and the national democratic uh, institutions. A colleague from Germany spoke about uh, diversity and I'd like to underline and to repeat this approach. Diversity is a key word. Second point, to move from the ESM to EMF. Uh, we defend this movement, uh, but uh, we need to underline the fact that this movement from ESM to EMF needs to be integrated, trying to find a new global framework for economic governance. And we need to avoid the reinforcement of the intergovernmental approach. It means this movement needs to be done in the framework of the community model. Finally, I'd like to thank Mary Kibiniemi for the OECD, to remember here the OECD recommendations. And I'd like also to underline one recommendation on the recover financial sector, the recommendation on complete, completing banking union. But also, your recommendation on better support citizens to face globalization are also very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, Mr. Eric Wert from France, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Il y a beaucoup de débats à la Commission des Finances et plus largement à l'Assemblée nationale française sur le. In the uh, Financial Committee and in the Parliament uh, of France, uh, the structural aspects of reforms are uh, discussed, uh, how to calculate the structural deficit, etc. And uh, this brings about uh, different uh, questions. But when we look beyond uh, instruments, uh, I believe that uh, there is broad-based agreement on which reforms are necessary in order to uh, promote economic growth and consolidate it. And as the uh, OSCD representative said, this is very important. But we also need to think about um, uh, whether the lack of investments uh, in uh, Europe, uh, whether the lack of investments uh, is caused by the fact uh, that uh, our processes are slow and that the investment plan does not uh, go hand in hand with economic cycles. We, maybe the uh, lagging behind in the, is the main aspect. Thank you. Thank you. And now Mr. Paulo Trigo Pereira from Portugal, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I would like just to make a comment and two questions of the for the speakers, which I thought was very interesting, their, their comments. Uh, my first comment uh, concerns the countries that have adjustment programs. And let me just say that passing from an extraordinary fiscal policy situation where you have to cut salaries, freeze pensions, freeze admissions in, in the public sector, um, freeze uh, progression and promotions in the public sector, so this is what uh, most of our countries who have under adjustment programs had to uh, let's say normal fiscal policy uh, it's not easy and it's understandable the, the 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 data that you have presented at least for countries like portugal and perhaps ireland and and others that um, uh, even though we are having a good record but of course we are changing a little bit the the, the policies because we could not sustain the same, exactly the same policy that we had in, in the adjustment programs. The question is the first to Mr. Hardo Hansen. Uh, he said something very important, that uh, 
there is a time lapse be between the decision to use structural funds and uh, their uh, real impact, which sometimes take two years, and instead of being anti-cyclical, they become pro-cyclical. And my question is, uh, have you got any idea how we could speed this up? Because this is a problem for Estonia, it's a problem for Portugal as well, and I believe other countries. And for Ms. Mari Kivimiemi, um, one important thing, very important that you said is that uh, we need to identify the bottlenecks to growth in regions. And my question is whether, first, uh, this could not be done if uh, countries adopted program budget, budgeting with uh, well-developed good indicators of performance to know exactly where are the problems. And secondly, if we could not know more exactly the regional impact of structural funds. Um, for instance, and I finish with this example, uh, in Portugal, we realize now after uh, half a million hectares of uh, uh, land, uh, forests were burned and 100 people were killed um, by the fires, we realized that the money didn't go exactly to the places where they should be. So perhaps more transparency on structural funds on regional basis would help. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And the last, last intervention comes from Mr. Uh, Marius Mavridis, Cyprus, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Last but not least, um, let me find my intervention. The biggest problem with the successfully completion of, successful completion of economic and monetary integration is that we cannot start from the beginning. Instead, we have to do it through structural reforms. Sometimes it is better to demolish an old house and build a new one instead of trying to fix the old one. It is well understood, however, that economies and societies are not houses. It is therefore inevitable to go through structural reforms in many countries in Europe and in the European Union overall. Recent experience in Europe has shown that reforms are easier in some countries than in others. In some countries, various interests like unions, the public sector, professional associations and other groups exert significant power on governments not to proceed with reforms. As a result, reforms are delayed and the cost of reforms is rising even more. If we can measure the value of foregone reforms due to the delaying of reforms, I'm sure we will all be astonished. The experience of Cyprus is worth noting. A lot of reforms took place during the economic and fiscal adjustment period program, uh, program period uh, under pressure from Troika, but a lot of reforms have not been done. Now that the adjustment program is over and the economy is growing, reforms are slowing down. Unfortunately, in Cyprus, we have the presidential system of governance and the opposition is stronger in the parliament. Maybe we have to wait until Troika comes back again. Just kidding. <laughs> I believe that the European Union must find a way to push for structural reforms and other reforms in member states before a member state goes under. When a member state goes under and asks for help from the European mechanism, it may be too late. It may be forced to proceed with the reforms, but the cost of the society will be very large. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. Um, now we have uh, approximately 15 minutes till the end of this session. Uh, uh, we have Questions, concrete questions to Mr. Hanson and Mr. Giliniemi, and then uh, Mr. Colteri also can make some comments or remarks at the end. So I will start with Mr. Hanson, please. Okay, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for all the comments and the, uh, and the questions. I think a few were directed to me, and I might comment on one other one as well. But uh, the first was uh, from our Portuguese uh, colleague about this, how to improve the public investment uh, implementation of all these EU projects and so on. And I'm not an, a, a public investment management uh, specialist, but I think one channel, a year ago in our country, when we looked at it and we saw this was very slow, the money wasn't moving very fast, and we said, this seems to be a problem. Some people would counter and say, 
speed is not the only thing. Quality matters as well. And I think you, we can err also in the opposite direction of just moving the money on all kinds of projects that are poorly, poorly conceived. In the end, you have recurrent uh, costs that you have to, uh, to finance. And in the end, you maybe regret some of these, uh, some of these quickly planned uh, projects. So uh, this one is clearly striking, uh, striking a balance. Maybe one issue is that we, th these are, there are three different parts of the general government. One is the central government using our own resources. The second is then local governments who are doing their own projects from their own budgets. And the third is, is then these EU funds which somehow are on a different track. And maybe at least in a kind of a macroeconomic planning uh, perspective to put these all together and to maybe have a, an opportunity when EU funds are not moving so fast then to compensate in those periods with more more uh, domestic investment and then when they start moving the EU funds then it's possible to scale back the domestically funded and make those investments somewhat more uh, somewhat more fungible that's just one possible idea there was a question from Mr. Beringer about the ECB uh, ECB policy, and I think, first of all, I think subsidiarity is an important uh, principle, and uh, I think many, much of the, what I was saying earlier is, uh, was derived from, uh, from that. As regards the monetary policy, asset purchases and so on, whether they're monetary policy or fiscal policy, it's, uh, this is very uh, tricky, and I think we have a, a framework in Europe of some of the, uh, the treaties and so on, which try to impose limits to assure that uh, when uh, that these two policies are to a large degree uh, separated. These are pro prohibitions on monetary financing and then the ways in which central banks uh, introduce certain operational targets are, are meant to be to guarantee that those principles are, uh, are adhered to. And I certainly believe in the, in the fact that we should maintain certain limits on, on policy. We have, for instance, a limit right now that uh, that the central bank only buys on the secondary market and can only buy a maximum of 33% of any one, one issue. That's meant to ensure that the market is still functioning, that private uh, investors are accounting for at least two-thirds of, uh, of the market, and it's to ensure that the central bank doesn't completely dominate uh, particular, uh, particular markets. I think it's very important that we, even sometimes when we feel that these are frustrating limits, we should, uh, we should abide by them. The other uh, issue is that when we were designing these policies, then uh, if you looked at more federal jurisdictions such as the United States where you have your own government bonds, then it was not, these issues didn't arise of whether the mixing up of monetary and fiscal policy. But uh, in the European case where po uh, politically we have not taken this decision yet to go to a, lar a much larger degree of mutualization, for central bankers to introduce that through the back door would be would be problematic, and I think that's why one of the it explains one of the features of the program is that four fifths of the asset purchases are bought on the accounts of the individual central banks. They earn the money from those uh, assets, and when there are losses, they absorb the, those uh, those losses. And I think it's a particular way of trying to do asset purchases, but respect the European uh, specificity where we have not yet taken these these political uh, decisions. Finally, I think there was an issue of, uh, of will some of these EFSI reforms uh, sub comp uh, compensate for, let's say, lack of structural reforms. And uh, I think that would be bad if, uh, if, it, were, uh, if it were happening. There was, a, I think there was a period when may, I think we were maybe overemphasized investment somehow, current consumption very bad, investment somehow very good, and I think there was even a period when the IMF was saying, if you're really good at, at planning public investment, these investments can almost create their own fiscal space, and therefore there's almost kind of a free lunch element. And I'm sure that it, in principle that's possible, because there's, there must be bottlenecks. There, in, if we were really ideal public investment managers, we could somehow uh, identify real bottleneck projects, and they could pay for themselves. But in, in reality, I think sometimes the uh, the ability of our of our systems to deliver a range of public investments, all of which are high impact, is uh, is it can be set in, in question. And in, in these circumstances, I think it's not so simple to uh, to just say the more investment we have, the uh, the better. Thank you. Thank you for these comments. And now, Ms. Kiviniemi, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the comments and also for the questions. I try to answer the ones which were. Uh, 
uh, made uh, to be answered by, by me and also comment some other issues you took up. So when it comes to these uh, uh, European structural investment funds and uh, cohesion policy, uh, I already in my presentation uh, gave uh, kind of some uh, concrete advice how to uh, proceed to the kind of fourth generation of uh, the co cohesion uh, policy. But uh, I have to say that many advances uh, have already been made uh, earlier. More transparency at the regional and uh, national level, yes, of course, uh, ex ante, ex uh, post uh, evaluation. And as many of you pointed out, uh, uh, this uh, funding should go hand in hand with structural uh, reforms. Uh, but also one of our advices is uh, to connect urban and rural areas uh, to support greater diffusion uh, of innovation and growth uh, from cities. Also, you should improve the capacity of all levels of uh, government when, when it comes to uh, using the funds, not only the FC funds, but also uh, the national uh, ones when it comes to investment. Uh, and also, you should uh, link uh, the cohesion policy and also uh, in general regional policies as closely as possible with other uh, sectoral uh, policies. Then the question of... Um, Productivity, um, yes, it really is true that it is a global, global phenomenon, and that's why also at the OECD we try to find answers uh, to that. We have uh, established uh, a global forum on productivity, uh, which meets uh, once uh, a year, and where we uh, try to find a solution also uh, to the question of our measurement. Uh, do we measure it in a, in a right way? but also to the question how to uh, improve uh, and uh, increase the productivity, not only national, but also at the regional uh, uh, level. Regulation was mentioned uh, by many of you, and yes, the OECD advice really is uh, to the European Union that less regulation and more harmonized regulation, so that also the SMEs um, have it easier, for example, in the services market, uh, to uh, uh, offer day services uh, in other uh, EU countries, which is not yet uh, uh, the case. So less and harmonized is, is, is kind of uh, uh, our advice and the creation of a uh, uh, single uh, market. And uh, the fourth point I want to uh, take uh, up is um, the question concerning uh, OECD's work that how do we uh, consider kind of the social aspects uh, in our recommendations and I have to say that they are of course built in uh, to our recommendations. Uh, what we encourage uh, uh, countries to achieve is not only uh, better growth but also inclusive uh, growth. Uh, we see that uh, too much inequality uh, it harms growth uh, in the long run and of course it also, as we have seen in many countries, also creates uh, political uh, instability. So our advice is really uh, to improve the opportunities uh, uh, for every person in all parts of the uh, countries, better education uh, policies, skills policies, uh, and also health and uh, social policies are needed, but also in order to tackle the challenges of the globalization better uh, international uh, cooperation so that um, all the uh, countries play with the same roles. Thank you for these comments and uh, Mr. Gualtieri, please. I've just, uh, I would just uh, a quick answer to the question on uh, EFSI Juncker plan uh, after Brexit, which is a difficult question, but at least uh, uh, we, uh, a few days ago, concluded successfully the, the trilogue on FSI 2, so now we have a prolongation of FSI, uh, a budget, uh, a new uh, budget for it, uh, so we have uh, transformed, we are transforming this as a more permanent instrument. Of course, uh, Brexit will create a, an issue for the whole uh, balance of the EU budget, but we are, I mean, confident that we uh, will uh, conclude positively the negotiation in order that uh, uh, all the commitments and uh, liabilities will be honored as said in a fair way. So uh, then we will be more for us uh, 
to update and improve our mechanism of own resources in order to continue providing financing to this uh, uh, instrument which has been proving to be very successful, which I think is complementary to the existing structural funds. And one of the new tools we are exploring and trying to develop in exactly the blending between the structural fund and FSA financing in order by enhancing, let's say, the grand component of the NSA project to make it more able to address market failure and suboptimal investment uh, conditions. So this is a, a new avenue that I think we should explore, which might work successfully as it is already working successfully. Final remark, just to very much stress, and I'm very glad that also OECD agrees on that, that we need to improve, the, let's say, the social dimension of our funds of the structural reform. This is absolutely essential. We're going to approve on Gothenburg, I understand, a new important document on the social pillar, but in order not to make it just a declaration, we need to transform it in concrete policy action in order to fully streamline this dimension in our policies, which is, I understand, essential to address the challenges, among which uh, I very much support the Mr. Desai comment uh, worth reflecting on how currently we are having productivity gain in the service but not in goods and that's uh, bring us back to the challenges of globalization and the growth potential and the need to uh, put together all the efforts in order to increase our productivity and growth capacity. Thank you. Thank you dear panelists and dear participants. The session is now over and then some technical information, uh, the buses uh, are waiting for you and uh, we have a dinner uh, starting at 8 o'clock in Estonian concert hall and uh, the buses will take you uh, on uh, uh, half past seven from your hotel so hopefully you will all come there and we will start tomorrow at 9 o'clock at 8.50 the buses will take you here